long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh. And welcome to the first episode of Hold Your Fire, a new podcast by the International Crisis Group. Let me say a few words about what this podcast is going to be about. Crisis Group's work is to be in the field and to talk to actors in conflict, understand why they're fighting, understand why they're killing, and try to come up with solutions to try to resolve and prevent deadly conflict. But we've also realized that so much of the work that we do, that our analysts do, is left out. You know, the conversations that our analysts have, it's the personal dynamics, it's the experiences that they have in the field. So I'd like to think of this podcast as crisis groups cutting on the floor, the good stuff that we can't put in our reports. That, Naz, I know I find endlessly fascinating, and I hope uh, you and, and our listeners will as well. Absolutely, Rob, and I think it really gives us a chance to go into the kinds of conversations that many of us have when thinking about these issues, but like you said, often don't make it into the text of reports and other publications. So before we get started with that conversation that we're looking forward to, we're going to be speaking today with Nathan Thrall, the former director of the Arab-Israeli Project at ICG. Rob, I thought we'd take a minute just to talk about some of the events of the week. I know that you've been watching closely the Democratic and Republican national conventions, and I'm wondering, what's your take on the conversations you're seeing around foreign policy issues? Well, yeah, I'm one of those uh, people. I've watched uh, virtually every hour of both conventions last <laughs> week and the week before. Brave man. Exactly. You know, I was struck by one thing, if you talk about foreign policy, and not much of it was about foreign policy, is that it seems to me that both parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, are in a conversation, almost a debate, maybe even a tug of war with themselves about the direction of their foreign policy. So in both cases, there's a struggle between the impulse to end endless wars. Mm. There's this great sort of loss of appetite among the American people for wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere. So that's one impulse. And you see it in both parties. And on the other hand, if you listen to the Democratic Convention, there's a lot of nostalgia for the days of the past, days of the President Obama, President Clinton, for American exceptionalism, which goes hand in hand with a certain military footprint. And likewise, on the Republican side, even as they speak about, and President Trump did last week, he spoke about ending the forever wars. And yet at the same time, it's a muscular tone about how the U.S. has to fight its enemies and fight Iran and kill its enemies overseas. And I think that that's very reflective of the state of American discourse with itself about the debate between American exceptionalism and the nostalgia for the past and the feeling that the U.S. is overextended and it needs some form of retrenchment. And Rob, can I ask, did you read the conventions either or both as demarcating and what you would consider an actual foreign policy platform or was much of it kind of signaling around exactly these sort of broad impulses that you're discussing? I mean, a little bit of both. On the Democratic side, there was a sense of we need to restore our alliances, restore the bipartisan tradition almost. I mean, if you listen in the last uh, day of the Republican convention, a number of Republican foreign policy luminaries came out and endorsed Joe Biden, whether they are people who were working for Mitt Romney and John McCain and President uh, George W. Bush and all of them saying we need President Biden because he's more like us, because that's his view of foreign policy. And so there was, that's kind of their platform, if you will, even as they say, as you know, that we need to adjust and adapt to the moment. And on the Republican side, it was a feeling of the American firstism of President Trump translated as enough being, and I think this was a line that one of the speakers had, under the Democrats and Republicans in the past, Washington, D.C. was the capital of the world. Mm. We need to come back for it being the capital of the United States. So that's their theory, which is you need to stand up for its interests rather than standing up in their view or the interests uh, of others and trying to be loved by everyone. So there are the distinctive themes of both conventions. But again, I think there was no clarity because there is a tug of war. There's a fight within both parties. 
for the future direction of America's foreign policy. Absolutely. And I think maybe we're seeing a similar questions around the actual foreign policy implications of an America first attitude in the ongoing Security Council wrangling around the so-called snapback provision of Security Council Resolution 2231, with what I think many read as a rebuke of the U.S. position this past week at the Security Council um, what's your take? Well, I mean, rebuke is a kind word. It's a diplomatic word for what happened. This was a thorough uh, <laughs> dismissal rejection of the U.S. Uh, approach. And, you know, we've written about it quite a bit. But I think if I want to boil it down to its essence, the U.S. took the position that from the beginning, and I think this was no secret, and President Trump said it, even candidate Trump said it, they wanted to do away with this Iran nuclear deal. They tried to do away with it through maximum pressure by reimposing mm-hmm. sanctions on Iran basically depriving Iran of the benefits of the deal, frankly hoping that Iran would walk away and therefore the deal would truly be dead. And when that didn't work, they went to the UN and tried to reimpose multilateral sanctions on Iran, invoking a provision of the deal they left. And I think the rest of the world said, thank you, but no thanks. You can't have one foot or both feet out of the deal and then say, oh, by the way, we want to invoke this one provision of the deal that we like, which would force others to reimpose sanctions. So I think it was clearly a rebuke. And I read it in two ways. Number one, a strong feeling, particularly on the part of Europeans, that the last thing they want now is a nuclear crisis with Iran in which they would walk away from the deal, all sanctions would be reimposed, Iran would then break from its commitments completely and resume its nuclear program. And on the other hand, I think we can't divorce what we were talking about earlier, U.S. domestic politics and what happened at the U.N. The vote at the U.N. was important because people had one eye on the vote coming up on November 3rd. I think looking at what now seems to be a pretty tight race between Vice President Biden and Donald Trump, in fact, one in which President Trump, but one in which Biden seems to have a lead, I think a lot of the European countries figured, why should we listen to President Trump and destroy this deal when maybe if we simply hold on until January 21st, we'll get an administration that will be prepared to come back into the deal. I have to admit, I don't know the text of every ICG report well enough to know if this is a first, but I really appreciated the line in the recent report calling for a collective shrug. Not a common prescription, I think, in foreign policy and diplomatic circles, but in a way saying it may be that the wisest and sanest strategy here is to, like you say, perhaps wait and see what administration other states would be dealing with in 2021, but also to not take the bait, if you will, to not respond to some of the provocations that the Trump administration and its officials are issuing towards European allies and other members of the council, but rather to insist that indeed one either is a participant or isn't. And if one isn't, then they are not in a position to to call for an activation of the snapback. I think you put it exactly right that this is a time where, again, because we're in this uncertain period, and it will be very, you know, for all the similar debates I mentioned at the Republican and Democratic Convention, we're going to be facing a very different world if Donald Trump is reelected as opposed to Joe Biden. And so I think a lot's going to happen in the coming months. And this was one episode, we'll talk about the other with Nathan in just a minute, where the Trump administration is going to try to do a lot of things to either solidify their legacy or complicate Joe Biden's. And this was one of them. And responding with indifference, with this collective shrug that I think is the first time crisis group has ever recommended, simply ignore it. That might be the best way to come. Whether that works with uh, what's happening between Israelis, Palestinians and the Emiratis, that's, uh, I guess, the topic for our next conversation. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You are listening to Hold Your Fire. Today, we are talking with Nathan Thrall about the UAE normalization with Israel. Hello, Nathan. Hey there. Great to have you. Let me just say a few words about you for our listeners. You worked with us for many years as a director of the Israeli Arab uh, Project, proving that there's life after crisis group. But also, I guess you chose to take, as LeBron James might have said, uh, your talents elsewhere. And congratulations to that. I might have a question for you at the end about why you left and what you're doing now. But anyway, you spent many, many years and you still are living in Israel and talking to Israelis and Palestinians. I'm curious, just to put in context for our listeners, What was behind the decision by the UAE and Israel? What was in it for them to announce this 
normalization, path to normalization, however you want to describe it? I think that there's very little change in Israel-UAE relations. Israel and the UAE have been cooperating for a long time. That's been quite well known. And what this does is it gives a small victory for Netanyahu domestically. He made a, an achievement by bringing this deal out into the open, or rather this relationship out into the open. And the UAE, of course, is now set to receive weapons, uh, in particular F-35s that it hoped uh, to get from the U.S. and probably drones from Israel. The question is that we should also be asking is, what's the effect on the Palestinians of this deal? You know, similarly, you could say that for the PA, this changes very little because of the close relationship between the UAE and Abbas's main rival within Fatah, Mohammed Dahran. The relations with the UAE were not good. And uh, similarly for Hamas, because of its close relations with Qatar, the relations with the UAE were not good. So you could say there, too, not that much changes as a result of the deal. And where you do see a, a potential change is, first of all, in the relations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority um, can uh, potentially now resume to what they had been several months ago, and the Palestinian Authority and Israel can resume security coordination, which the PA relies on for its existence. If you could explain that, because the argument for the deal, one of the arguments on the Emirati side, is that this was the way to get Israel to stop, suspend its plans to annex parts of the West Bank, and it was because of those plans that the Palestinian Authority had interrupted its security cooperation and its regular dealings with Israel. And you didn't really mention that that's what the Emiratis would say. That's what was the big get for this. And that's a big get for the Palestinians as well, who were dreading annexation. At least that's what they were saying. And it was the concession that Netanyahu made to get to this point, wasn't it? That is indeed the excuse that the Emiratis would give for the deal. That's what gave them cover for the deal, is, is the claim that they were actually helping the Palestinian cause. Of course, it, when you see the reactions from all Palestinian political figures, none of them feel that way. And I think we should also question the degree to which the de jure annexation was indeed suspended. There have been all kinds of conflicting claims and reports, unattributed sources claiming that Israel had committed to a several-year suspension of a de jure annexation and others, including an Emirati source, telling the New York Times that they had merely received a commitment from Israel to suspend de jure annexation until the November U.S. presidential election. Yeah, so Nathan, can I ask just to follow up again to what you said? Is your sense, uh, so assuming that would be kind of the rationalization that the UAE would give for why they're not uh, betraying the Palestinians in this deal, for the Palestinian Authority, is this a way of moving forward? Does this provide them with a way of moving forward that did not exist prior to the deal? What what does it mean to the PA in your view? So I think that for the PA, the deal is a disaster because what matters is what's happening on the ground. And what's happening on the ground is day in and day out Israeli expansion. The notion that there is two states and a democratic Israel and there's a green line and there are Israeli settlements that, you know, we all condemn and we know that, of course, it's temporary and they're going to be removed. That entire line of argumentation and belief system has been dealt a terrible blow by the, the UAE now joining the camp of Europe and the U.S. and much of the rest of the world and saying, we're going to pretend that the occupation is temporary, we're going to have normal relations with you, Israel, as you continue to expand and obliterate any possibility of Palestinians enjoying some kind of sovereignty in the future. You see an interesting bifurcation among Israeli liberal Zionists in their reaction to the deal with the UAE. On one hand, and I think this is the larger group, you had people sighing huge sigh of relief. Annexation is over. We can go back to business as usual. Two states is still, quote unquote, alive. And we can return to, you know, the world that we existed in nine months ago, or maybe two years ago. And on the other, you have some, and this is a much smaller group, who say that this deal is a death blow for the outcome that they desire, which is a two-state solution. Because what's happening every day is massive infrastructure is being built 
you have, you know, six lane highways going through the occupied territories. You have separate, quote unquote, fabric of life roads being built for Palestinians so that they're removed from the main roads for Israeli settlers. You know, when you drive from Tel Aviv into a West Bank settlement, you don't feel that you've left Israel. You are, for many of them, you don't go through any kind of checkpoint whatsoever. You're west of the separation barrier, which has already de facto annexed roughly 10% of the West Bank. And for the other ones, you go through a the equivalent of a, of a toll booth in the U.S. with Easy Pass. I mean, you just fly through on your highway, you enter this town, it has Israeli police, it has Israeli municipal signs, it has Israeli funding from all the ministries, you feel that you're in Israel. And that's on the other side of the separation barrier. So that's the process that the UAE just signed off on. They've agreed that they're okay with that. And, you know, much of the world has agreed that they're okay with that as well. I want to push back a little bit just to test you on this. And I hear what you're saying. I'm sure you would say that uh, every Palestinian you've spoken to feels that way. But the absence of normal relations between Arab countries and Israel has been a fact of life now for decades. And it hasn't improved the situation. If anything, as you described it, the situation has been going from bad to worse, even during the time that Arab countries like the UAE, like Saudi Arabia, like others refuse to have normal relations with Israel. So it's not as if something dramatic has changed. Again, so it's not clear to to play devil's advocate. So what? So now they normalize. Why is this going to make anything worse when, when they were not normalizing? Israel was already on that trajectory. And then it just strikes me, and working on conflicts around the world, there are not that many where I know countries that refuse to have normal relations with others, despite the sometimes very egregious actions that they undertake. So maybe explain to us a little bit why this is so significant when A, as I said, you know, it's not as if the absence of normalization had produced progress, and B, this does seem to be a bit of an anomaly in world politics. So what are your thoughts on that? I'd say a couple of things. First, the Israel-UAE deal, as I say, their relations were already good. You know, there's already huge business Israeli business in the UAE. There's huge Israeli business in Saudi. So I don't believe that there was an effective boycott in place in the first place. It's Israel that had said, Israeli leaders that had said, we greatly desire bringing this relationship out into the open, so much so that we are willing to pay a price for it. So the only value was that there was an Israeli incentive. And there are very, very few Israeli incentives for giving anything to the Palestinians. So this was one of the few last remaining Israeli incentives. I actually think it's, you know, not rational for Israel to desire the normalization as much as they do. As I say, I I think it actually changes very little But Israel did desire it, and it is one less card that the Palestinians uh, have. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You are listening to Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. And today we're talking with Nathan Thrall about the UAE normalization with Israel. I think something you said earlier, Nathan, speaks to Rob's comment and to yours, is what is the value symbolically, if nothing else, of repeatedly reiterating the illegality of the settlements, of the anomaly of the occupation itself, and of the situation the Palestinians are in, right? So in a sense, even if normalization is simply making public something that has been happening for years, how much does it matter for states to repeatedly keep saying the same thing year after year, which is, this is illegal, this is not acceptable, this is occupied territory, et cetera. And I mean, in a way, it's a factual question. Does it actually matter for the Palestinians? Does it change anything? But I think perhaps also, Rob, to your point about the anomaly, I think the question is, should states treat the occupied territory specifically, not Israel in general in terms of diplomatic relations, as an ongoing source for illegality and as a way that they have to reject Israeli conduct within the occupied territory, right? So in the way you would think about Turkish-occupied Cyprus, for example, that no states, they may have normal relations with 
Turkey, but they don't normalize any engagement in Turkish-occupied northern Cyprus precisely to underscore that that is seen as anomalous or unlawful. And I think in a way it comes down to the question of if UAE is the first in other Arab states moving in this direction, as Rob says, does it change anything to start to publicly say what seems to have been happening over time anyway? You know, one of the things that your question touches on is what is Israel? When we're talking about not normalizing, what is Israel? Is Israel a democracy within the 1949 armistice lines and there it's running a separate regime in East Jerusalem that is formally annexed and a separate regime in Gaza that is controlling from the outside and a third separate regime in the seam zone in the territory that is de facto annexed by the wall and a fourth regime in Area C where it controls all Palestinian life in, in every sense and a fifth regime in areas A and B where there's some level of Palestinian autonomy is there a separate Israel from all the, I mean, Israel itself claims that's inaccurate. So we, Israel, claim that, for example, the annexed Golan Heights and the annexed uh, territory of East Jerusalem and 26 surrounding villages are part of Israel. So if I have a moral position that I do not want to engage with an entity that is expanding eastward, and totally eliminating any possibility of a normal life for the indigenous people. I'm constricting them in smaller and smaller enclaves, and I'm pushing my own idea of what my sovereign territory is constantly eastward. You know, that project is succeeding. And if I have a moral position that that is wrong, and I believe that the entity that's responsible for what's happening in East Jerusalem and in the Seam Zone and in Gaza is the state of Israel, not some separate entity, because after all, all three branches of the Israeli government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, are creating the policy in the occupied territories. So if I have a moral position that I object to what the state of Israel is doing, then what sense does it make for me to say, I won't interact with you, you know, in this little place where you're, you know, I won't interact with you in Khan al-Ahmar because that's where you're about to destroy a Bedouin village. I don't actually understand that position. It's premised on a huge apparatus, a huge belief system. It's a theology, which is, you know, the opposite of what I just said. It's that you know, that there is a separate Israel from the territory that it controls and that East Jerusalem is not part of Israel and the West Bank is not part of Israel and the settlements are not possible part of Israel. That's just, that doesn't look like the situation on the ground to anyone who, who lives here and experiences it. I think this is probably a longer conversation we'll have here just in terms, you could put the moral issue, but again, I think that would apply to many cases where the question is, can you distinguish a state from its policies? And there are many states, and I don't want to make comparisons, but there are many states that are engaged in egregious policies, and yet normal relations are being uh, continued with them because you try to compartmentalize. And that may be the wrong moral position, but as a political posture, I do want to ask you this question, which is, from a Palestinian perspective, and you obviously spent a lot of time talking to them, and they've, they've been quite upset, to put it mildly, at the UAE's decision. But isn't this in some way a clarifying moment for them? Because they have seemed to be depending or counting on some outside help, whether it's from the Arab states, whether it's from Europe, whether it's from the US. And again, to echo what you said earlier, their conditions have worsened pretty systematically for the last several decades. And so if today they know, they realize salvation is not going to come from the Arab world in any form. It's not going to be because they're going to deny Israel the benefits of normalization or, or, or whatever else. Does it not put the burden back on them to try to figure out what they're going to do, what their leadership is going to do, what they're going to do in their divided polity between Fatah, Hamas, West Bank, Gaza? Is that where the answer will come? I'm just now sort of asking you whether you think this could help the Palestinians as a clarifying moment or whether they simply don't have the tools today 
to achieve their goals, whether their goals be independence in their own sovereign state or some other solution they may be uh, entertaining? So I'd say a few things. First of all, they don't have the ability to achieve their goals. They don't have the, the tools to achieve their goals. Second, what few tools that they do have, they're not using as effectively as they could. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Third, I would distinguish in terms of a clarifying moment. Yeah, it is clarifying, although, of course, they knew about the close UAE-Israel relations as well. It is a clarifying moment, but what I would distinguish between the Palestinian public and the Palestinian leadership. And so I think that it's especially a clarifying moment for the Palestinian public, which at some point may put real pressure on the leadership to change its policies. But the leadership itself is not going to change its policies because they are truly in a dead end and they have committed to a strategy that has totally failed and they see no way out of it. And I'll just give you an example. You know, when it looked like annexation, de jure annexation was imminent, they were dreading this move. And at that time, it looked, I mean, when Trump and Netanyahu gave the press conference in January of this year, Netanyahu said afterward, I'm going to annex on Sunday. And what he meant by annex was the map that Trump showed, which is 30% of the West Bank and creating Palestinian Bantustans. So at the time at which they believed that an annexation was likely and that the annexation that was going to happen was going to be of 30%, leaving them in totally surrounded, in islands surrounded by Israeli territory. At that time, I asked, uh, you know, a senior Palestinian negotiator, let's say it happens. After it happens, what position will you take? Will you still say two-state solution, uh, we're under occupation, and 67 borders, East Jerusalem as the capital? And he said, of course, what what other option is there? That is the position we'll take. And just, just to be a jerk, I said, and let's say that they annex... 90% 90% and you have all, you're only in area A Bantustans and you're, you're totally, the whole leadership is besieged in the Mukata in, in Ramallah. Will you change your position? And the answer was no, of course not. So I do think that it can change perceptions of, of the Palestinian public, but I, I don't think there, this has been any kind of awakening for the Palestinian leadership. I think it has been somewhat of an awakening for the Israeli left, which had been relying on an argument that was already dead before this happened, but this notion of a diplomatic tsunami, and we have to make peace with the Palestinians or else, you know, the UN and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I think that that argument was already dead before before this UAE deal. And maybe to a certain extent, the shift in the, either the Israeli left or in the American left and the European left, that the idea of annexation being, de jure annexation, being so shocking as to kind of cause a, a global reaction of some kind, as you point out, uh, doesn't seem to have been the case. I mean, I guess in a sense... There is the question, Rob, of whether this this clarifier argument, right, insofar as we could think of it in other conflict situations as well, that the Trump administration's approach at least kind of brings forward a reality that we perhaps have been uh, pretending about earlier. Does it shift the way we do foreign policy? Does it shift the way the different players see the options on the table? And Nathan, it sounds like you're giving a pretty sobering assessment of what options even remain for the Palestinians at this point. I want to say, I think you made a very good point, Naz, which is the real clarifying moment was in this whole eight months of annexation debate. That was the clarifying moment. The whole world and the Israeli left and the Israeli right and everybody saw, we're going to do the most flagrant thing. We're going to do the thing that brought sanctions on on Russia. And no consequences. This was imminent, and there were going to be no consequences. The Biden campaign, the EU, it was obvious. And so I think that is the clarifying moment. And now what we're seeing is a rapid, rapid acceleration of the de facto annexation. I mean, the day after or within days of the UAE deal, 
there was a meeting where they discussed all of the new infrastructure plans that they have for the West Bank. Plans to increase the settler population by hundreds of thousands. Plan, you know, just in one area alone near Ramallah to put a hundred thousand settlers. So that is the real process that's happening. And all this talk of, of the URA annexation was mainly just clarifying and in, in showing everybody that there will be zero international reaction to it. This is a conversation that I'm sure we'll come back to. I would love to hear you more even about what you think at this point, whether a two-state solution is still viable or whether we need to think beyond that. And uh, I forgot to say that anyone who wants to know what Nathan thinks, and I think you get a glimpse already of how fascinating his his mind is, should go by his book, The Only Language They, they Understand, which uh, really has, has so much to it. But I, I want to maybe conclude with this question. So crisis groups methodology around the world is usually to speak to both parties, parties in conflict, and try to reach interest-based compromises. I mean, that's what we do, and we do it with some entities that are really beyond the pale. It sounds from listening to you, but maybe I'm putting words in your in your thoughts, that that's not a methodology that you think can work in this case. And I don't know if that's partly why you left Crisis Group, because you wanted to explore other avenues, but it is, for us, a slightly a dilemma, because if that's the way we are around the world, right, with terrorist entities sometimes and with uh, criminal gangs and others, where we say you need to try to understand the interests of both sides and then find a, a solution with incentives and disincentives. Do you think that that's a methodology can, that can work in this case? Absolutely not. I don't think that that methodology can work in this case. I think that what we all need to appreciate is the possibility that we are witnessing a very, very successful colonization that is going to wind up like America with Palestinians as Native Americans in reserves. And all of the evidence suggests that that's where we're heading. Now, what's the interest-based solution that's going to prevent that outcome when there are basically no obstacles in the path of the Israeli state and the settlers and those who want that outcome? You could try and convince the Palestinians to have the nicest reservations they possibly could, but I don't see an interest-based compromise that can be reached in this conflict. And furthermore, I think the whole paradigm that the whole international community is using right now for thinking about this conflict, which is not what I just described, helps to facilitate exactly the outcome I'm describing. Maybe on that depressing note, as I said, we will come back to this. And uh, it is something that I could speak for the crisis group staff. We struggle with uh, every day and trying to think, is there a way forward? But we'll come back to you for those ideas. I want to but really thank you for the time that you've spent with us. Naz, maybe you, you want to add a word? Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to add, Rob, before we end this uh, episode of Hold Your Fire, can you tell us what Crisis Group published this past week? What should we be reading? Well, great, thanks. We published uh, three pieces. The first one was uh, about what you asked me earlier, the snapback, the effort by the U.S. to reimpose sanctions on Iran. It came out right as the U.S. effort went down in flames, and I think it's a great primer for anyone who wants to understand the UN process, how, what's going to happen, and our advocacy for this collective shrug. Uh, we also published uh, a piece on the, the coup in Mali, which raises an interesting question in which much of the population, of those who were demonstrating in the capital city of Bamako, were against the president who's been toppled. And so the point we make in what we wrote is, yes, you need to go back to some form of constitutional order, some form of democratic legitimacy, but no, not a return to the past, because the past is precisely what led to this unrest and to the coup. And third, a very deep dive into the politics of ethnic conflict in Myanmar, which I highly recommend for anyone who wants to understand the longest ranging, uh, longest lasting conflicts in the world, which is the conflict in Myanmar. What is behind it? What is the ethnic dimension and how it can be overcome? Hold your fire a podcast by the International Crisis Group. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to Hold Your Fire. We'll be happy to answer any questions you might have related to foreign policy and conflict prevention, and please send those to media at crisisgroup.org. Thank you, Naz. Thank you, Nathan, for the time you spent with us. And thanks all of you for listening. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Hold Your Fire. Thanks very much to both of you for having me. Thank you, Nathan, and have a good week, everyone.